I don't know that I'm especially optimistic that there is a way out from this court. I think that a number of decisions that they're making, you know, Dobbs, the abortion case being right at the front of the line, are going to have devastating, tragic consequences for people, for millions of people in America. And I think there will be a reaction to that. I don't know what the reaction will look like or what it can achieve, but I don't think they'll get a free pass with the things that they're doing. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. We are doing a special, you know, newsier with Pod today because of the, I'm just going to say cataclysm of the last Supreme Court term, um, the term that just concluded a few weeks ago, which, you know, I've seen a lot of like non-hyperbolic legal scholars call it like the most, either the worst or most momentous term, certainly in recent memory, you know, possibly ever, I've even seen some people say. It was an incredibly reactionary court and on a bunch of very high-profile matters of both statutory interpretation and constitutional law, incredibly ambitious, far-reaching upending of what had been the status quo ex ante before the court. The obvious example of that is the overturning of Roe v. Wade after 50 years in a decision that completely eschewed any opportunities at half steps, minimalism, incrementalism, respecting the reliance interests of people who've uh, come of age in a row in America, very quite explicitly said, we're rejecting all of that. We're not doing half steps. We're not pairing here and there. We are fully overturning row. It cannot stand. It was terrible from the beginning. Boom, done. Similarly, though not quite as radically, some of the reasoning in the Bruin case, which is a gun case with Clarence Thomas writing the, the majority in that case. Again, a very kind of like far-reaching and grandiose sort of vision of what the Constitution requires the court to do, this kind of unapologetic swag in the sort of words of the court and its bearing. You know, I was thinking about like, you know, sometimes they refer to like pop songs as anthemic, which just means like they're like big, like, in your face, like these were very anthemic <laughs> kinds of decisions from the court. And there's a whole bunch of other cases as well. And, you know, there's been all sorts of quantitative analysis about how much this court has turned the law around, how it's the most right-wing court since the Lochner era, which was during the New Deal. And I'm trying to get my hands around it. Obviously, I talk to Kate, uh, my wife, all the time about this stuff. But one of the things I have trouble with is like, what are we doing here? It seems to me that there's like a prior question, even to the question before the court about constitutional rights, what kind of democracy we have, to what it is that judges and justices do, what method they're using, and whether they're describing what they're doing in good faith. And it's there where I really start to lose my mind. Because it really feels to me like the court isn't just engaged in a project of reaction, but reaction combined with a sort of gaslighting bad faith deception about what it's doing. Reaction that is cloaked in a rhetoric about methodological approach. Alito's like, I'm not doing this because I'm a person who hates abortion and thinks it's the murder of a child and I don't want people to do it. No, no. This result is required by fidelity to the text of the Constitution, its original public meeting, the history and tradition that flows out of that. And in fact, we should go back and look at some 17th century writings on whether women can have abortions. And again, I'm not just putting, I'm not just doing this because I believe in this. No, 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 no. This outcome, well, which I happen to believe in, is required by the methodology that we have to use. I find this reasoning so insultingly disingenuous, drives me insane. So I wanted to talk about like, what is happening from a methodological perspective with the court, with the court's right-wing majority, and what it actually means. Like, what I really want to say, I have a conversation about is like, is this as in bad faith as it seems to me? And I thought a great person to talk to that about is a Dwight professor of law at Columbia Law School, who's a constitutional scholar who wrote a fascinating book about the courts, the constitution, and our rights called How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. He's co-chair of the Oversight Board, which is an independent body that reviews content moderation decisions on Facebook and Instagram. He has a million different plaudits and awards and the like. He clerked for the late Justice John Paul Stevens, I think right before my wife Kate went into those chambers to clerk. Jamal Green, uh, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great to be here. 
I want to do something super basic and maybe like build up, right? So rather than talk about the court, I just want to talk about what do judges do? How should I understand what a judge does? And let's let's refine it a little bit. On matters of constitutional law, on an issue before the court, we'll keep it in that place for now. An issue becomes before a judge, and it might be a district court judge seeking an injunction of the travel ban, or it might be an appellate court judge who's reviewing that, or it might be a Supreme Court justice on you know, abortion. And they're presented with arguments about whether something does or doesn't essentially violate the Constitution. What does a judge do? How would you describe it to a layperson what they do? So I think this is a harder question than you present it as, because I think different people have different views about this. And I'm not even sure that justices on the Supreme Court have a coherent view about the answer to this question, right? So there's a traditional conception of what a judge does in constitutional cases that goes all the way back to Marbury versus Madison and the origins of judicial review in the United States. And that's just a judge resolves disputes between parties, right? Like you and I have a dispute about a piece of land or a contract or whatever. You put your garbage on my curb. Yeah, right. And someone has to resolve it. And so you go to a judge and they resolve it. Marbury versus Madison was a case that said, constitutional judging is just that as applied to government in the Constitution. So, you know, William Marbury, this guy has a dispute with Jefferson and and Madison, and the court has to resolve it. And so when a court gets something to resolve, it has to look at what the sources of law are. Like in the contract dispute, it's what did the contract say? What does contract law say in our country? In constitutional law, it's, well, what does the law say? What does the Constitution say? The Constitution is just a piece of law as applied to a dispute between parties. And so the the judge's only job is to just resolve the dispute however, in whatever way makes the most sense according to the law. We've come to a place where the Supreme Court understands its job in much more grandiose terms, that its job is to tell us what the Constitution means, Mm. uh, which means that it's got to interpret the phrases in the Constitution and tell us exactly what, what they mean, tell us what they mean for all time, resolve these disputes regardless of the particular facts they present. I'm going to tell you, you know, if you're, if I'm Clarence Thomas, I'm going to tell you exactly what the Second Amendment means for everyone, not just resolve this dispute between these two parties. So it, it's somewhere, you know, along that spectrum from judges just resolve disputes between parties, and sometimes those disputes involve the government. And the judge's job is to speak for the Constitution and speak for our rights in some deeper sense. Tell us what liberty means. Tell us what equality means. That's such a profound point, even that, and very clarifying and useful, the difference between resolving a dispute, right? Like, so so in the Bible, of course, Solomon, right? The dispute is, who is the mother of the baby? (laughs) They come before Solomon and his job to say, who? There are disputes that need someone to be like, you and you use. Like, like yeah. you know, this is how it this is how it, it goes. And so Solomon, of course, you know, takes out the sword, says, I'm going to kill the baby. And that reveals who the real mom is. He resolves the dispute that way. But it's useful to think in those terms because, like, he's not, in some ways, revealing a factual truth, right, in his wisdom of drawing the sword. But the whole goal is to resolve that dispute <laughs> in a just and equitable way. And I never actually think of judging that way anymore because I think— and this is something I want to get into with you. I think the propaganda <laughs> of Scalia at all, particularly, that the court's job is to tell us the meaning of the Constitution is so successful that I almost think that's kind of the default understanding of everyone, even people who don't buy into what you know Clarence Thomas or Samuel Alito say about it. I, I think that's exactly right. And you, you use the example of Solomon, and, and Justice Scalia actually has an article where he talks about that example and says, that's exactly what judges are not supposed to do in constitutional cases. And he says they're not (laughs) supposed to do it because, you know, they sit atop a pyramid of other courts. They've got to tell courts what the law is. And if you're just sort of resolving disputes based on kind of whatever is just or something like that, or balancing, or you don't give enough guidance to lower courts. That's part of his point. The problem is that it's in the nature of a constitution that it has to enable us to govern ourselves. And if you say, Everything that applies to modern disputes was decided in 1788 or decided in 1868, and there's nothing we can do about it. Like, almost literally nothing we can do about it. Maybe you can amend the Constitution, but only by the terms that were put in place in the 18th century. Then that denies us our self-governance. And so that, that takes a very important piece of constitutional law away from us. And it's not necessary, right? That's, that's not how most countries think about their constitutions. It's a specific move 
intended to produce a, a, a specific set of outcomes. It's that part that I have a really hard time with, because as I understand it, and we can talk a little bit about sort of originalism and textualism, but before we get to that, I mean, as I understand it, what I found so maddening about this entire enterprise from a just rhetorical standpoint, as a kind of like adjacent outsider, right? So I don't have a, legal, a law degree. Obviously, my wife is a very brilliant legal scholar and clerked on the court, and so I get, you know, osmotically through her, I get a certain amount. But to me, it's the construction of this notion by the Federalist Society and conservatives over the years that basically says the following. What you bad liberals do is you just substitute your own personal preferences, your policy preferences for the law and for what the Constitution says, and you read into the Constitution whatever you want people to have in your namby-pamby love for, for rights or whatever, <laughs> except some rights, right? You don't like the Second Amendment, yada, yada. And that is unserious it's chaotic, and there's something offensive about it because it's not real. It's not formally, it's not rock solid. We do this rock solid formalistic thing. We don't just read in what we want. We go through this method, but then that just gives them what they want. <laughs> and it just seems like it's one thing to like run roughshod over stuff. It's another to lie to me about what you're doing. And I just, it makes me so angry to feel lied to. Well, I, I understand the the impulse, and it does feel very result oriented. And I think ultimately, it is result oriented, right? So, in the sense that when originalism became a thing, which is in the early 1980s, basically, it's basically the Federalist Society and people in the Reagan Justice Department deriving a methodology in order to achieve a specific set of outcomes. One of which is overturning Roe versus Wade. One of which is eliminating prayer in public schools, and there was a prayer in public schools case on the docket this term, one of which has to do with busing and school integration, and there's affirmative action right on the docket next year, right? So you can draw the lineage. That said, I hesitate to say that any specific person is consciously thinking, okay, here's my here's the outcome I want to achieve. And so let me, you know, me let me monkey with the law in order to get there. I think people engage in motivated reasoning. And right. they do that yes. on the right and the left. It just happens to be that the right has a lot of power right now, and that's what they're doing. Well, but to go back, I mean, we're talking about this sort of interesting, like, what's the meaning of the Constitution versus resolving disputes or a kind of coming to some formal methodology, right, that produces the right answer versus judging, okay? As, again, I'm, I'm sort of setting these up as opposites, but I think it's useful. I mean, Justice John Paul Stevens, I think, and also Judge Richard Posner, who was someone else that Kate clerked for, who are different figures ideologically, but— I think united in this idea of like, you can't take the judging out of judging. <laughs> and there's this sort of derogation of that by the rhetoric of originalism and formalism that like, that's unserious to be like, well, there's different competing interests on both sides and this is a tough call and we're gonna try to balance them as best we can. And when you encounter a person in your life who's good at that, you say they have good judgment. <laughs> like, and you, and, you, and you want them to make important decisions. And there's this idea that like that basic test or that basic method of approaching these questions is like ludicrous or unserious. Justice Stevens, who, who really embraced the approach that you're suggesting of sort of case-by-case -case adjudication, judges or judges, but my favorite anecdote of his, one of the litigants at the Supreme Court just keeps calling Justice O'Connor, Judge O'Connor, Judge O'Connor. And Chief Justice Rehnquist at the time corrects him and he says, you know, counsel, actually, it's, it's Justice O'Connor. And Stevens jumps in and says, Article 3 makes the same mistake. Don't worry, counsel, because uh, the Constitution <laughs> calls them judges, right? It doesn't call them justices, right? And justices implies like they're these kind of, you know, people in robes with the, and Rehnquist himself added stripes to his robe to make him seem more important than the Constitution necessarily contemplates. I think this is really, you know, you look at the abortion case from this term, and there's an example of this, one that, by the way, you know, the side I'm going to praise in a moment isn't what I would do if I were a judge, but it, it counts as judging, right? So Chief Justice Roberts, in his concurring opinion, says, look, this is a dispute between Mississippi, the state of Mississippi, and someone challenging its abortion laws. All I have to say is whether I think the Constitution requires the striking down of this law. I think it does require the striking down of this law. He thinks it doesn't, right? But the idea that the point is that there's a dispute between litigants and in a kind of case-by-case -case way, you make a judgment about what the Constitution might require is definitely not what the majority is doing, right? In the abortion case or in any number of cases, they want to say, we speak for the law, and they want to attach it to a 100 or 200-year-old conception of what the law is, which, of course, has predictable results. And in fact, the case that most 
shows this, right? The idea that they are not adjudicating resolving a dispute is the EPA case in which there was literally no live dispute. Like it was the reductio ad absurdum of this precise thing because, and if you could talk us through why this is the case, they essentially took a case that doesn't even meet the basic threshold for like a live controversy and injury that people were taught in constitutional law. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And the the EPA case is this case where the EPA ultimately, at some point, it involved the Clean Power Plan, which was enacted during the Obama administration and gave a bunch of power to the EPA to help set targets for carbon emissions. And Trump administration repeals this. And then the repeal of that is overturned by the D.C. Circuit. But the Biden administration says, actually, we're not going to put it back in place. They withdraw. We're just going to withdraw it. We'll come up with a new rule. So there's no rule. There's nothing. They're not doing anything. And the court comes out and says, 6-3, of course. Court says, well, maybe if you actually enacted something, you would do the wrong thing. And therefore, we've got to step in and say, here's, you know, you can't do that. Which is really the opposite of what the Marbury versus Madison tradition of what judges are about is there's no controversy until there's a controversy. Unless you think your job is to just kind of step in and be the oracle for all of the American people. And that's really problematic in a democracy. There's also something about the sort of valence of humility and activism that I think is is also part of this, right? So this critique gets developed about judicial activism, right? That the Warren court and liberal jurisprudence is insufficiently humble before the democratic branches, that it's a judicial activism, the unelected judges. You hear this in right-wing critique all the time. And I do feel like it's flipped a bit, the valence of that that critique as a source of frustration by liberals towards this conservative court, but also even from the court's liberal minority against their colleagues in several of these dissents, which basically say, hey, the mask is off about all these things you used to talk about, about activism and deference and humility. You guys are just like going for it. No, that's exactly right. And I do think that there's a criticism, an activism criticism, that can be launched against certain decisions of the Warren court, right? So that's not, I don't think that's an unfair criticism. But the conservative response to it, which was initially, no, 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 we need a methodology that enables us to be restrained. And that's where originalism and textualism came from. And then once Republican appointed judges started to gain more power and be, have actually be in office, That stopped being about restraint and it started being about, no, this is the one pure true theory. And even if it requires us to get rid of previously decided cases or or whole generations of precedents, you've still got, you've got to maintain that purity. You know, the originalism came about as a response to wanting to say, look, we're not really bound by these precedents of the Warren court. And now it's kind of full bore. You know, we don't do any judicial restraint here. We just honor the constitution in its purest form. And the strongest version of that is Neil Gorsuch is very much in that vein. Clarence Thomas is very much in that vein. And Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh, I think, to slightly lesser degrees. We'll be right back after we take this quick break. Maybe this is a good point to talk about what originalism and textualism mean. And you've written about your admiration for Scalia in some ways and in terms of his success as a kind of ideological entrepreneur in fashioning the originalism as a kind of default method and thing to be debated with, even by people who are not its adherents. Yeah, so I wrote a piece in The Times right after Justice Scalia's death in 2016. It was titled Liberal Love for Justice Scalia, which is a little stronger than I would have put it myself. As you know, um, writers don't write their headlines, right? But it was admiring of Justice Scalia's ability to communicate with ordinary people about what he was doing, right? So the liberals have been kind of bemoaning for a long time that, oh, Justice Scalia, when he talks about originalism, he's so charismatic, he's so witty, he's so funny. You know, people listen to him. It seems so basic, so straightforward. We think we're right, but we can't, we're having trouble articulating it. I think it was Dolly Lithwick who said, you know, Justice Scalia can throw off a quip, and but the Justice Breyer needs an hour on Charlie Rose, you know, to explain his methodology. And there is something to that, right? We're writing law review articles and saying, you know, we're right. And Justice Scalia can, in one sentence or one paragraph, offer what seems to be an attractive method. The attractive method being, look, when you have a document and you're trying to figure out what it means, you look at what the people who wrote it intended it to mean, or you look at what the people who adopted it thought it meant at the time. That's how we think about contracts, right? That's how we think about a will. If I draft a will, 
The problem is this is not a very good fit for constitutional law because we're a self-governing people, right? I didn't write a contract in the 18th century to be bound to, and neither did you, and neither did any of us. It's a document that has to govern a pluralistic society, which the society of the 18th century wasn't, a pluralistic society over time that governs itself, right? That's the challenge. And that challenge is spectacularly failed by originalism. It's a challenge for any methodology to figure out how do you govern yourself over time? How how does a people govern itself over time? But originalism doubles down on the problem of these people actually don't represent us in any meaningful way. Say more about that. I hadn't thought of it, conceived of the, the central problem that constitutional law is trying to solve as how a people governs itself over time. Yeah, I think there's this idea, you know, you can think, I talk to my students about this sometimes, you can think of the Constitution as like a puzzle that you have to solve. And the original drafter sort of created the puzzle. And our job is to figure out how the puzzle, you know, to fit the puzzle together, looking for the right skeleton key to like figure out the puzzle. Or you can think of the Constitution as a framework for governance, right? Something that we actually today need to make useful to us in some way. We actually have to take some ownership over it. We have to have some agency or we're not a democracy, right? If you say a bunch of people who are not a majority, by the way, a bunch of white men are going to get together and craft a document, tell us what all the rules are, and tell us the only way you can amend this document is if you're basically unanimous, but we're not unanimous. We're just a minority of the population. And then that just, you wind that up and that just goes. And you actually can't change the document because they've put in place rules that say you can't change the document. That's not a democracy, right? So what do you do with that? You either say, we don't live in a democracy, whatever. We just live by the 18th century old rules, which I don't see how that's any different from a monarchy or something else. Or you say, well, maybe there's a way of thinking about this document that actually does give us some agency in the present, that actually does help us to understand not just how to make laws, but also how to constrain those laws, right? That there's actually the Constitution grows with us as a people. It is susceptible to that interpretation. Our Constitution's not especially specific on the things we care about. It's quite broad. And the framers, from Jefferson to Madison to Hamilton, over and over again say, you know, this is going to evolve over time. It's the only way to think about it. But you've got a revolution in the judiciary right now of people who are trying to persuade us that outcomes that are often profoundly undemocratic are required by this undemocratic way of understanding our Constitution. And you can say, if you tell me that's the only way to to understand the Constitution, then I'm going to tell you this isn't a Constitution I can respect, right? I don't think that's the only way to understand the Constitution. But, you know, that's got to be the terms for anyone who believes in self-government is that you know, to the degree it's capable of evolution, we've got to lean into that evolution. Right. I mean, again, to get back to this idea of judging, right, we're trying to strike a balance between two imperatives that are in tension, right, which is self-governance, right? We want to be able to make decisions for ourselves, but we need some sort of thing that orders the means by which we do that over time. Otherwise, you know, we're just starting from scratch all the time. So, And those two things are intention. Absolutely. Right? Like, we want to change because we want to respond to things. But we also don't want to just be like, well, every year when the, you know, when the the ball drops, we're going to come up with a new method of governing us together as a U.S. Like, clearly, we're not going to do that either. And those two things are just going to be intention that we're going to have to resolve in dynamic, difficult ways. And that speaks a little bit, I think, to the difficulty of, like, articulating what's on the other side of constitutional methodology from originalism. Because it does come back to this kind of like, to me, Stevens inflected pragmatism about how you synthesize and resolve inherent tensions between competing interests that both have good cases. (laughs) Well, one thing to recognize about this problem, which again, is it's the problem of all constitutionalism. Right, not just us. Not just the US, right? But the the way to think about this problem is, look, we've had this problem for, for a long time. We haven't had originalism forever. We're not writing on a clean slate. We've got lots of judicial decisions. How do they make those decisions? How do we live with them? How did we get along over time? Well, sometimes we didn't, right? But when we did, it's incremental, right? It's the judiciary usually doesn't get too far out ahead of or behind the polity, or it gets punished when it does. And it makes decisions incrementally. It abides by its previous decisions. So when lawyers talk about stare decisis, and which is another way of talking about precedent and the importance of precedent, right? That's a key part of self-governance, right? It's not just some lawyerly technicality, right? It's 
when the way we've worked out abortion rights is in these fits and starts over this very complex, very controversial issue over 50 years. And we've gone back and forth and legislation's passed and it survives or it doesn't survive. Judges are picked through a political process and they exercise their judgment and move the law one way or the other. Constitutional law is a little shifty that way, but it's shifty because it's responding to us because we're shifty because we all disagree with each other about these things. Right. But when one side of a long spectrum steps in and says, no, actually, I've resolved it for you. I've decided no one has any abortion rights, period, end of story. That is a response to the problem of constitutionalism that denies the problem, right? It, it just says, mm-hmm. no, we're just going to ignore the problem. We're just going to, hey, that's what it was back then, and so that's what it is now, no matter what's happened since. And again, that's a problem for self-governance, which happens in lots of ways, not just people passing laws, but the judicial process is part of that process of self-governance. Yeah, and you get these reductio ad absurdum moments, to me at least, where Alito's citing some, you know, 18th century British legal scholar who people then like quickly point out was like also like, you know, calling women witches. And it's like, well, sure. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Like not surprising. Yeah, not surprising (laughs) because it's not not like the two things just don't line up. But you guys have sort of concocted this methodology. There's also the fact that like there's a meta methodological irony here, which is that originalism itself is sort of constructed ex nihilo in the 1980s. So it's like, there's not even like, there's a sort of ahistorical historicism to it. The sort of fetishization of the final word of this particular moment itself is a fairly, of fairly recent fashioning. Yeah, this the single strongest thing any judge has ever written against originalism was written by John Marshall in, in 1819 in McCulloch versus Maryland, a case about whether Congress had the power to create a national bank. And he says, look, the Constitution's not a code it has to adapt to the various crises of human affairs, right? It it has to evolve over time. And he's trying to say, look, don't go back to the founding and tell me about whether you could craft a bank. Let's look at our actual human experience with the things that the bank is trying to respond to, to decide whether this is something Congress gets to do, right? That's what we generally do in constitutional law. That's what countries around the world that also have constitutions generally do with constitutional law. You don't just wipe out all of your lived experience And in the case of abortion rights, our experience with having rights for women is part of that lived experience, right? The first time the Supreme Court ever struck down a law for violating the equality rights of women was two years before Roe versus Wade. This was not an era when there was a lot of women's rights going on. So just to say the, the law was just frozen, you know, all of our rights were frozen at a time before women had rights. Is again, it's a it's an affront to self governance. It's offensive. It denies our the pluralism that didn't exist before our recent history. So it's just problematic along any number of dimensions. And as you say, nothing about this is required or you know, it's not conservative, it's reactionary in the sense that it's rejecting our traditions in order to go back to a kind of fantasy of uh, several generations before. There's also, to me, the other thing that gets me as someone who's very, very interested in Reconstruction and very invested in that period of history and learning about it, and you have written about this yourself in some scholarly realms, is that there's also, when people talk about the founding fathers, there's there's really two foundings, two founding moments of American constitutional democracy. And the second founding, which is, happens after the Civil War and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, creates anew in some, some ways the nation in a way that like the founders, who we never talk about as founders, literally no American school child can tell you who wrote the 14th Amendment, even though it's, you know, the key text that produces modern multiracial democracy. And those founders knew very well they were engaged in a fairly radical project of producing multiracial democracy. And it seems like somehow the conservatives don't have the same fetishization of them or like that founding era as they do of the original one. Well, I'll tell you the deepest irony about this, which is that the principal drafter of the 14th Amendment, John Bingham, he grew up in Ohio. He grew up in a town called Caddis, Ohio. And if you go to Caddis, Ohio, there's a statue of John Bingham outside the courthouse there. And Caddis also happens to be the hometown of Clark Gable. And the historical society there told me when I talked to them that everyone thinks that the statue is a statue of Clark Gable, right? That that (laughs) Clark Gable was memorialized here, which is really ironic given that, you know, Bingham's 14th Amendment is kind of thrown on the trash heap by redeemers um, who are trying to reclaim the South for for white Southerners 
And that then leads into Jim Crow and 100 years of repudiation of the 14th Amendment. And Clark Gable's most iconic role is is as Rick yes. Butler in Gone with the Wind. And Gone with the Wind is like the classic Redeemer narrative. That's incredible. So it's really <laughs> ironic. But you're, you're right. We don't know who those heroes are. We don't valorize them. We don't recognize even basic things like the fact that most of the things we argue about, including gun rights in states, including abortion rights in states, including affirmative action in state and local government— we're interpreting the 14th Amendment. We're not interpreting directly interpreting Correct. the Bill of Rights. And that's really broad language that is subject to different interpretations by different populations over time. So this idea that like there's a bunch of like specifically written down rights in the Constitution and that's what we've got to adhere to, no one's arguing about any of that, right? That's not what this is about. It's a way of deflecting from the text that actually matters to these controversies to some other text that actually, even in a formal sense, doesn't matter to these controversies. Yeah, say more about that because I think most people don't know this, right? So quick history on the 14th Amendment, um, you know, when it's created and, and when it's ratified and what it does. Yeah, this is the 14th Amendment's ratified in 1868, right after this, the uh, Civil War. It was put in place in order to produce a kind of civil equality for recently emancipated slave population. But it's written quite broadly in the first section of the 14th Amendment, which is the one that people pay the most attention to, talks about the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. It talks about the right of due process. It talks about the right of equal protection. It talks about the right of citizenship and says everyone born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen. So these are really kind of soaring moral principles that the framers of the 14th Amendment were trying to put in place. And the other thing that the 14th Amendment accomplishes is it applies the Bill of Rights to states. So when we're thinking about how the Bill of Rights and how the rights protected by the Bill of Rights apply to state governments and not just to the federal government, we're actually looking to the text of the 14th Amendment, not looking directly at the Bill of Rights. So Yeah, just to pause there, because I think just to the people may know this, right? So when you think about the Bill of Rights, it says Congress shall make no law infringing on X, right? So that's Congress, right? So until the 14th Amendment, my understanding is, I don't know, could like, you know, the state of Alabama, I mean, it depends on the Alabama state constitution, but say like we have a state religion in Alabama, it's Christianity or it's Episcopalianism, whatever, that you know, that wasn't incorporated, the first, <laughs> the first Amendment. Well, a bunch of states did have state religions prior to the Civil War, right? Massachusetts and Connecticut did until well into the 19th century. And that, that wouldn't wow. have been viewed as violating the First Amendment because the First Amendment applied to the federal government and not to states. Um, and that, that doesn't change. Really, it doesn't change until well into the 20th century when scholars of the 14th Amendment, which had been largely ignored, at least in this, in this way, go back and recognize the 14th Amendment as applying the Bill of Rights to the state. So it actually doesn't happen until fairly recent history. Again, all the controversies, you know, affirmative action and abortion and even gun control, at least at least as applied to state governments, controversies over birth control or over, over same-sex marriage, and these are all 14th Amendment-related controversies. So they have nothing to do with Madison, nothing to do with the Federalist Papers, nothing to do with the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention or Hamilton or Jefferson or Washington or any of those people. Um, they have to do with the Reconstruction Republicans, um, who were a pretty radical bunch for their time, but who are not memorialized in nearly the same way within our kind of public reverence for the Constitution. Yeah, this is a thing that drives me, uh, also drives me nuts. And just to be clear for folks, like the question presented in Dobbs, right, is can, you know, basically can Mississippi pass this law and does the federal Constitution guarantee essentially a right for women to have reproductive agency to terminate a pregnancy? And the question of that right being guaranteed is a question of what rights the 14th Amendment guarantees, right, that would bar a state from infringing on them. But it's squarely the 14th Amendment. Like, that is the textual part of the Constitution that that whole debate, Roe, you know, the jurisprudence before and after it, Dobbs, all flows through a question about that amendment. And I'll go further than that and say that amendment is framed in highly abstract terms, right? So, you know, if I tell you the Constitution requires equality— Right. If I put that into a constitution, I probably don't mean the constitution requires you to do everything that I currently think is equal. <laughs> it's a moral principle. It's one that, especially in right. a constitution, which is for self-governing people, you have to work that out over time. It requires judgment. It requires some reference to changing standards. So at the time, the 14th Amendment was also written just by white men. Women couldn't vote. African-Americans couldn't vote in most U.S. states at the time. Right. So this is also a kind of retrograde sense of representation, but it's written in a broad way. So, you know, if you've got a choice, do I read this broad thing in a broad way, the one that 
um, makes reference to how we understand rights today? Or do I read it in a way that's simply bound to the minority group that decided to put it in place in the 19th century? There's lots of good reasons to say, you know, democracy requires that we make some reference to who we are today. That doesn't mean you just give carte blanche to legislatures to do whatever they want, but that does mean that the values that we read as being the values of the Constitution have to be in some dialogue with who the American people have been since 1868. And the other thing about the 14th Amendment that I keep coming back to, because when you talk about this profound question about how a people governs itself over time, when a people itself changes, a definition of what it is, their aspirations, their collective vision of their own collective identity, their moral considerations of equality, how do we do that, right? You know, the originalists will say, well, look, hey, guys, we got an amendment process and there's been a bunch of amendments and, you know, you want the ladies to vote and go out there. And, you know, they did it with the 19th. So and the thing that I always come back to is the the part of the Constitution that makes multiracial democracy in the modern sense really viable is the 14th Amendment. And it didn't happen through, like, the normal amendment process. It happened on the graves of 600,000 people with a gun pointed to the heads of the defeated Confederacy and told, ratify these amendments or you're not getting back in the union. And that's the only reason we have it. It didn't happen through like normal politics. Yeah, no. And of course it didn't happen through normal politics because half <laughs> right, the country right, had right. just tried to kill the other half in order to, to, to secede right. from the union over white supremacy, right? So that's what they're trying to defend. So they're not just going to sign up on the dotted line without some coercion. Right. And that's, you know, that's how you protect the rights of vulnerable people sometimes. I think about the Equal Rights Amendment along these lines. So when someone says, you know, amend the Constitution, the Equal Rights Amendment is passed with basically 90% majorities in both houses of Congress. It's approved by President Nixon, so not, not some kind of progressive, and gets ratified by 35 states representing more than 80% of the U.S. population, right? So there is no way of describing the Equal Rights Amendment as having not been popularly ratified by the American people. It was overwhelmingly ratified, and in fact, more ratified than perhaps any actually consequential amendment has ever been ratified because people could actually vote and participate in meaningful ways. Right. So if you tell me, you know, no, that's not in the Constitution, that's not something we should really pay any attention to. But we should pay a lot of attention to something that, you know, the Second Amendment, let's say, where which is put into the Constitution solely by white men in the 18th century when people are using muskets and there's no serious standing army and there's no police forces and so forth. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know what to do with that. And I, I'm not saying that therefore means the Equal Rights Amendment is the Constitution and the Second Amendment isn't. But we have some options for how we think about constitutional interpretation. And some of those options are consistent with the fact that we are a different people now than we were in the 18th century, and some are not. And the idea that, you know, that this comes down in some way to the like the popular sovereignty of Americans in the 18th century, that's just bogus. Yeah, it's a crazy notion. It's almost self-evidently ludicrous that, (laughs) I mean, obviously I'm biased, but it's just like the feeling that I have at the end of this term is this sort of claustrophobia feeling, right? Because it's like the claustrophobia of the methodological adherence of the majority, which is like, well, sorry, let's let's see, um, trans rights, let's go, well, what do we got in 1788 on trans rights? I'm sorry, not a lot. Like, okay, well, we know where all this is going. Right? Like, you create this methodology that's going to be, like, by design, like, completely unresponsive to the dynamic and changing nature of our popular understanding of rights and equality and all these things, A. And then, B, the 6-3 majority with lifetime tenure, it just feels like I feel like I'm in a, a room with the walls closing in, and I'm not someone whose body's on the line. I mean, I just feel this as a, you know, politically, I'm, I'm not someone who just had their literal reproductive autonomy taken away. Well, well, we'll actually see, you know, you, you were interested in the bad faith question. We'll really see next term when the court takes up affirmative action where originalism goes with that issue because the people who drafted the 14th Amendment, that generation, engaged in race-based affirmative action themselves. It, yep. They would have thought it completely bonkers to say that, <laughs> that a, a state can't engage in trying to uh, help out marginalized minority groups. They wouldn't have even known what to make, how to make sense of it as something that a state was attempting to do. So when we'll see if originalism disappears, you know, the conservative majority tends to talk about 
the Constitution as, quote, colorblind, but that's not a that's not an originalist notion. The 14th Amendment doesn't even, even mention race. So it, it doesn't, at least the Section 1 doesn't mention race. So it's not a textualist view. It's not an originalist view. It's a modern conservative view. They're entitled to that view if, that, if that's the view they have. But to associate it with some formal understanding of the Constitution will appear to be bad faith, and we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll be right back after we take this quick break. How do you think about the way out of this? I mean, you're you're someone who has devoted your life to the the law and the Constitution specifically. You're a constitutional scholar and theorist. You clerked on the court. I feel like people in your line of work, and I'm, you know, Kate, similarly, I mean, it's like you can't think it's all just will to power (laughs) with post hoc justification the way that I'm sometimes tempted to, right? Because then what are you doing? But like, how do you think about the state of constitutional law and the way out of this current situation we're in with this court? Well, I I don't know that I'm especially optimistic that there is a way out from this court. I think that a number of decisions that they're making, you know, Dobbs, the abortion case being right at the front of the line, are going to have devastating, tragic consequences for people, for millions of people in America. And I think there will be a reaction to that. I don't know what the reaction will look like or what it can achieve, but I don't think they'll get a free pass with the things that they're doing, at least in the medium term, maybe in the short term, but maybe not the medium term. As I think more deeply, you know, can someone who teaches constitutional law really think it's, you know, just power or something like that? I do think that most judges, most lawyers are socialized to a certain understanding of their role. I don't think originalism is the dominant methodology among lawyers and judges in America. I think that it is the dominant methodology among the ones who have power at the moment. And, you know, I look at someone like Sandra Day O'Connor, who was, and I, you know, she made lots of decisions that I completely disagreed with. And she was from a political party that, that I'm not a member of, right? But her understanding of her role was as, you know, I've got to be in some conversation with the world around me. And my role is different than a legislature. It's different than political actors. I have to make reference to cases of the court. I've got to make reference to judicial doctrine and legal doctrine. I'm not just a politician, but the way in which I do that, you know, has to be somewhat incremental. It has to show that the various important commitments on either side of these these issues are commitments that that matter, that count, that I care about in some way, that I'm grappling with in some way. And as long as the court does something like that, you know, it doesn't attract so much attention. People get interested at the end of June every year, but then, you know, uh, and it kind of it kind of allows politics to play out, which is you know how you live in a in a pluralistic society. The way the current majority is is acting is a kind of my way or the highway approach that says there's actually nothing that you can do that I will listen to or have any reason to listen to because I'm taking my directions from the 19th century, um, or at least my conception of the 19th century and not from the American people. Yeah, and I think there's this other question you just touched on that that to me is one I've really been wrestling with. This is a very sort of abstract question, so I'll try to articulate it, which is what is the law and why is the law binding on people in in a society that we say adheres to the rule of law? And I've been thinking about it a lot with like the testimony of like Rusty Bowers, the Speaker of the House of the Arizona State House, who gave his testimony for the January 6th committee where he's basically presented with a ludicrous but like perhaps facially defensible legal argument to essentially overturn democracy in the state of Arizona. And he doesn't do it because it's wrong. And at some level, he is socialized enough. <laughs> like he talks about his faith very clearly. He's a Mormon and he's, he's a practicing and believing and pious man by all accounts. And he says it would be breaking faith with his God and his belief structure to do this. But in, in broader, when you take Rusty Bowers and you look around, you say, well, why didn't the coup happen, right? The people who were fomenting the coup were often making legal arguments that were preposterous, but recognizably phrased as legal arguments, particularly in the case of John Eastman, who had clerked for Clarence Thomas and had some kind of legitimacy, right, as a speaker of law, right, or an arguer in law. And ultimately what happens is the sociology is what holds. Like the people making decisions believe enough in the basic precepts of American democracy to say this is ludicrous and we're not going to do it. But only because those 18 people or however many like adhered to it, you know? And when I look at the court, I think like 
What happens if that goes away? That's what the law is. It's the socialized practices of the people who have law degrees and have power and what they think is and isn't beyond the pale. Yes, I think anyone who teaches constitutional law, you know, the moment when students recognize what the house of cards looks like upon which this is all built, (laughs) is that there's not some, you know, consensus view about, you know, there's so many just legal norms and norms of political behavior that, we adhere to because there's kind of a tacit agreement that if we don't adhere to them, the country will fall apart. That I think that was kind of Trump's superpower in some ways is to not care about those things at all. And if enough people want political power, then they'll get behind that and also think that, you know, you don't care about the legal norm and it's enough to make a kind of preposterous formality. You're seeing this really with the so-called independent state legislature doctrine. This is a thing that's going to show up next year at the Supreme Court, where the claim is that legislatures, when they construct congressional districts, are not bound by judicial interpretations of their state constitutions and are maybe not bound by the governor when the governor chooses to veto a statute. So it's just whoever controls the legislature can just do whatever they want when it comes to districting no matter what the state constitution says, no matter what the federal constitution says, because the federal constitution has been read to say very little about this by this Supreme Court. So we're not that far away, potentially, from seeing incredibly rogue state legislatures constructing districts however they want, maybe selecting electors, presidential electors, however they want, with really no state or federal constraints. And the kind of constraint that prevents a state legislature from going rogue and ignoring the will of its population, that's a norm. It's a strong, deeply felt political norm and legal norm, right, in the sense that they should be bound by the law. But if you think that whatever I decide is what, you know, if I'm given the power to decide, then anything I decide is right. You know, that's the kind of ignoring norms view that leads to political disintegration. And that's something we really should genuinely be worried about. Yeah, this political disintegration has been front of mind for me because, again, to go back to, you know, American history. So you're starting to see these states, you know, there's this, I think, incredibly disingenuous argument that opponents of Roe would make which said, you know, this has really raised the temperature on this issue because it's been taken out of the state legislatures and taken away from the people and put in the courts. And if you put it back into the democratic arenas and in states, then we can have the laboratories of democracy sort of sort out their different conceptions. And the people of Alabama will want different things than the people of Massachusetts without the big boot of the federal government telling them blah, blah. And what we're seeing now instead is you're going to start to see movements to try to prosecute across state lines, to criminalize movement across state lines. You're going to have a question about drugs the FDA say are safe and effective that can be purchased by Americans and whether they can be shipped across state lines. And all of a sudden, you start to get this like real specter of, like, disunion, you know, in a deep sense. And again, I'm I'm not going to compare, like, you know, the Fugitive Slave Act and these, you know, prior vision of disunion, which is a, a completely separate set of issues that have no analog in modern life, I don't think. But, like, I don't think it's good for the country if we start having fights about this stuff. Like, are you going to go prosecute the woman who crossed state lines for this abortion? Are you going to bar federally approved drugs? Like, that starts to feel like a kind of unraveling to me. Yeah, the analogy to the Fugitive Slave Act, I, I think, you know, one has to be careful because, you know, you don't want to look like yeah. you're comparing, you know, someone who opposes abortion rights to, to someone who in favor of slavery or something like that. And that's not, I wouldn't make that comparison. But the way in which they are the same and the lesson of the antebellum period is that when you have these questions of great moral urgency about which Americans are deeply divided, that you can't have these sort of state-by-state absolutist solutions because that is the road to disunion. That is the road to, you know, people view this in existential terms, right? Like whether you can decide, whether you have the power to decide whether to become a parent or not is the most important decision people make in their lives, right? So people will view these uh, questions in existential terms and, you know, people on the other side, right, who um, believe that, yeah. Life, human life is at stake. I um, mean, people are murdering, you know, potential babies also see this in existential terms. And there's no way around. We've got to come to a place where we are essentially negotiating about this. The court as a country, as a nation, the court came to that through Roe versus Wade and the subsequent decision, a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey in the 1990s. The court has come to that. That's what the court's been kind of trying to do is basically negotiate over it. There are better ways, I think, of negotiating over it than handing it necessarily to courts in every instance. I think 
I actually am someone who thinks that national legislation, if it was genuinely bipartisan and actually involved genuine negotiation and wasn't just rammed through by someone is actually a good idea on this kind of issue. Yeah. Um, but we don't get there by just saying, you know, carte blanche, just as any other important right to people, we don't just say, because, you know, laboratories of democracy, et cetera, et cetera, if someone wants to segregate their schools, go ahead, you know, different strokes for different folks. You know, we don't say that with rights that we think are really important and for good reason. I want to close on this. And I, I wonder if you'll bristle at this thought experiment, but I'll try it anyway. There's a guy that most Americans don't know whose name is Leonard Leo. He is probably one of the most powerful private citizens in America, even though no one knows who he is. And he is the kind of key sort of convener at the Federalist Society who was put in charge by the Trump administration of essentially kind of creating the pipeline for their judicial nominees, particularly the Supreme Court nominees, and producing a kind of pipeline that would get people onto the court that he and I think co-believers in his ideological vision could trust, okay, to interpret the Constitution and, and, and to judge in the way that they felt was the right way, which, you know, is the kind of originalist way that we've been describing. If you had that role, and I don't mean this in a political or ideological sense, but if like Jamal Green was the person who was going to kind of oversee the pipeline of the next generation of judges and justices who are gonna be tasked with the very fraught and, and difficult work of interpreting the Constitution in a growing and multiracial society, pluralistic society, like, what would you look for? What would be the intellectual habits or the types of thought or character traits that you would want? So I would look for the usual obvious things like intelligence and, and good judgment. But I think the piece of this that I'll add, maybe the character trait that may be less obvious is empathy, which is something that President Obama got in trouble with since he said that he was looking for empathetic judges and people thought he meant, you know, he was looking for lawless you know, judges who don't care about the law. Obviously, that's not what I meant. mean. That's not what he meant either. By empathy, you know, the ability to see arguments from someone else's perspective, the ability to stand in the shoes of another. I think that's really important for giving justice to people, right? So the people who appear before you to understand the position that they're in. But I think it's also really important to understand the position of your adversary and understand it from their perspective. Because I don't think that in the long term, one can have a good Supreme Court or one that has any legitimacy unless everyone's talking the same language. You, know, you, you reach positions by getting that fifth or sixth or seventh vote not by being a heroic dissenter. So I, I think you need sort of both sides of empathy. I want someone who's you know, has shares my ideological predisposition because I think these are political appointees and they should be in contact with politics, broadly speaking. But I want them to understand the other perspective as well because I want them to be able to speak to, to listen to, to hear from, to be heard by those other people as well because I, I think I don't see this as a something that, that is sustainable as perpetual war. Yeah, and I think that that, I mean, as a sort of final note here, I mean, the thing I think about a lot, and I've tried to explain this to, or tried to talk about this with people who share my views on abortion rights and, and liberals is, from the sort of anti-abortion perspective, right, their experience was a kind of constant bait and switch portrayal, particularly in, you know, three Republican nominees in Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice David Souter, and, and Anthony Kennedy, all of whom would fine for abortion rights, during their career, particularly on the question of Roe, right? And I say to people all the time, like, imagine if Sotomayor was, like, on the other side of Dobbs. Like, imagine how much you would lose your mind <laughs> if, like, an Obama appointee had been like, yep, yeah, we should reverse Roe. And, like, there were a lot of people that felt that way, you know, after Casey. And there were a lot of people who felt that way, you know, through the years on, on some other issues as well, I think particularly with Souter. What my understanding of what happened, well, the reason I raised Leonard Leo is they then thought the way to correct for that— <laughs> was basically to cultivate a methodology and set of character traits that would insulate people from the kind of contact with the give and take that you're talking about that to me is necessary for good judging because they were so scared they would be betrayed again. And so they created this sort of pipeline of cultivation and this sort of ideological hothouse precisely to ensure against that happening again. And they were successful, but in so doing have produced a method of quote-unquote judging that is in some fundamental sense zealous and inimical to the pragmatism of real judging. Yeah, that was the strategy. And, you know, I, I think maybe it's my naive 
optimistic naivete. I don't know. I don't know if I'd say optimism because I'm not that optimistic, but maybe it's a bit naive, right, to say we've got to claw that back. And the way to the way forward is not to emulate that. Part of my worry, and this gets into like the debates over court packing and 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 so forth. You know, the left should play hardball in the same way that the right does. I'm very wary of kind of doubling down on the notion that the way we solve our political and social problems is to hand them to a court that is most sympathetic to our views. I think that's just Mm -hmm. not a sustainable way of mode of self-governance. I think we need to reduce the power of the court in any number of ways. And that's where I would focus. And that's part of where I say empathy is, you know, I I want a court that's going to leave more things to politics, not take politics over. Jamal Green is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He's author of How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart, a book that sort of makes at length, in some ways, the argument that he just said there at the end of the podcast. He's also co-chaired the Oversight Board, an independent body that reviews content moderation decisions on Facebook and Instagram. He's a, a really brilliant and special thinker and scholar, and it was a great pleasure to have you on, Jamal. Thank you. Great to be here. Once again, great, great thanks to Professor Jamal Green. That was really, I thought, clarifying. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I know people have lots of them on the Supreme Court right now. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod. Email at withpod at gmail.com. And be sure to follow us on TikTok by searching for withpod. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by Donnie Holloway, Brendan O'Melia, engineered by Bob Mallory, and features music by Eddie Cooper. If you are a very observant with Pod listener, you know there's a certain name that I didn't just say there, the one and only Tiffany Champion, who has departed, sadly and unfortunately, which is breaking my heart, she will forever be part of the WithPod family, but she is moving on to some other things. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. 